Hello and welcome to Ocean Calls, the podcast making waves on issues that matter to friends of the sea. I'm Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. In previous episodes, we discussed some hot issues like illegal fishing or deep sea mining. But the burning topic we're going to discuss today is perhaps one of the most complex because of what's at stake and who's involved. We're talking about something referred to as the High Seas Treaty, also known as the Treaty on BBNJ, which stands for Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions. It's not catchy, but it is important. We're talking about a deal to conserve biodiversity on the high seas. Because, believe it or not, there is no comprehensive framework in place to govern important things like resource extraction and conservation in these areas that cover two-thirds of the ocean. Earlier this year, delegates to the United Nations were supposed to strike a deal on a legally binding treaty, but they failed. Talks are officially on hold and they're set to restart again sometime soon, or at least that's what they say. Joining me to make sense of all this and what it means for our oceans are two experts. Alice Vadro, a political scientist specialised in environmental policies at the University of Vienna. Hello, Alice. Hello. Nice to hear you. And Julian Jackson, who leads the Pew Charitable Trust's European campaign to protect ocean life on the high seas. Hello, Julian. Hi, Jeremy. Lovely to see you. And... As always, at the end of the episode, we'll hear from a well-known person talking about their favourite marine animal. Today's guest on Ocean Favourites is Norwegian football star and environmental campaigner Morten Thorsby. Now, to the high seas. And first, a beginner's question from me. What's the official title of this treaty? What should everyone actually be calling it? Well, it's a new legally binding instrument for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's super catchy then, Julian. Yes, that's why we like to call it BBNJ. <laughs> Another kind of introductory question, I suppose. What is it that we're actually talking about? This is a long way over the horizon, right? But what is, what is the high seas? So the high seas, it's a legal construct and it refers to what is normally uh, the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So that means the waters that are 200 nautical miles beyond uh, coastal states, uh, exclusive economic zones, where those exclusive economic zones have been agreed. So typically 200 nautical miles be offshore and, uh, and normally most of the water column and the seabed, but sometimes not quite the seabed as that might go a little bit further than 200 nautical miles. What I would respond is that um, the high seas are a global common. They belong to all of us. So that would be the non-legal, non-political response, but more like a normative response. Um, And that's one of the most challenging issues that you have the freedom of the high seas principle applying to these areas and making it a very difficult kind of object to be governed. It is, as I said, it's over the horizon. What's really there? What is it that people are interested in? Why? I mean, we're going to get to the controversy about why this treaty has not been agreed yet, but what's there that's useful to mankind? It's a wonderful resource that we all depend on, uh, whether or not we are a coastal state, whether or not we depend on fisheries for our livelihoods, although that's um, obviously one of the uh, immediate impacts that that people sort of think of um, But in terms of uh, uh, the massive amount of the ocean that is the high seas. It's uh, part of a carbon cycle. It's um, part of the weather cycle. Um, so intrinsically, all of the Earth systems rely on the ocean. It's important for food security, extraction of resources, shipping. There is a lot of uncertainty regarding what is actually there. I think that scientists have given us um, some kind of idea of what might be there. And this um, has led to expectations on the availability of living and non-living resources that might be important for industry, many economic sectors. And I would like to point to two of them because these are the ones that also raise controversies. So on the non-living resources side, we have the mineral resources in the seafloor, 
And on the living side, we have marine genetic resources that are also like a key issue that is discussed in the, the high seas treaty negotiations. But there is little scientific evidence on what exactly is there, how it will serve society, how it will translate in economic figures. We do not know, but it raises expectations. It's like often described as a new gold in the high seas that many states and many companies have an interest in. Julian, talk us through this treaty negotiation. Where are we at the moment in simple terms? As I said in the introduction, we were close to getting a deal across the line. It didn't happen. What's the situation at the moment? So we are at the final kilometre or two of a 20-year marathon. So uh, the UN working group was kicked off almost 20 years ago. Uh, They agreed to talk about biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. They then agreed to have... Uh, discussions about a binding uh, agreement. And we're now at the fifth uh, intergovernmental conference, which has been formally charged by the by the UN to actually conclude a legally binding instrument. So we're almost there, uh, but we're not quite uh, seeing final agreements. Alice, what's the real goal? What's the best case scenario? What was the ambition when they started out these these conversations on trying to get this deal done? I would say the ambition was to have an instrument that allows states to govern the high seas, to be able to really identify, designate and manage marine protected areas, areas in the ocean that can help to conserve marine biodiversity, but also to to agree on environmental impact assessment, who should conduct them, when, under which conditions, who decides whether an economic activity can go on or not but then also to address issues of global inequalities. So to find a a sort of compromise between interests of the global north states and the global south. So those that do ocean science in the high seas that can explore and exploit the oceans and those states that do not have the technological and scientific capacities to actually access the high seas, to do the kind of research that is needed for both for environmental protection, but also for transforming specific resources into economic properties and also to last and but not least to really find a solution on how to regulate the access and benefit sharing to marine genetic resources in these areas. Did you know that the ocean may be a rich source for new medicines? Today, most drugs derived from natural sources come from land-based organisms. But... Research suggests that ocean organisms have huge potential to help us fight such diseases as cancer or lead us to develop new antibiotics. And I'd, I'd understood that the one of the major stumbling blocks was this question of marine genetic resources, the ability to extract interesting molecules from sea life in some way and to use it for medicine. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, many states wanted to see um, monetary benefit sharing, so a specific uh, mechanism that would allow the transfer of economic or monetary terms to states of the Global South. So similar to the International Seabed Authority that was established also to redistribute money that comes out of the commodification of mineral resources. And many states of the Global North do want to prevent that, not just because it's technically almost impossible to trace. So how can you trace the process from uh, a water sample collected in the high seas to the development of specific medicine? It's almost impossible. And so many states um, were afraid to see um, some kind of an over-bureaucratization of ocean science, of marine scientific research. So I think that the key issue was that many states of the global south wanted to have some kind of access regulation assuming that access is not equal. So, for instance, the US, the European Union, they said, well, the access to the high seas is open. You know, the freedom of the high seas allows everybody to just do what they want. But not everybody's got the money to pay for a very nice boat to go out there and spend weeks and weeks cruising around, have they? That's the key point, I think. And it's very different from the extraction of mineral resources, because with the extraction of mineral resources, you do have a damage on the environment. But You take a water sample, there is no damage on the environment. And that's also one of the arguments why it should not be regulated as strictly. 
But the things that have been discovered up until now, the medicines that have come from things which were found in the high seas areas, how did that all happen? Was it, you know, a Japanese research vessel goes out, finds a sea cucumber that has some interesting molecule in it, and they develop it, and they can just claim it, and it's up to them. Is, is that how it works? Yeah, pretty much the freedom of the high seas and, and as for that. I think what's worth bearing in mind, though, is that because it's relative, access is relatively prohibitive, as you say, it's tens to hundreds of thousands of pounds a day on board a research vessel. Uh, to go to the high seas, much of the application for genetic resources so far has been from uh, marine genetic resources within national jurisdiction. You can get a dinghy, you can, you know, jump off, jump off the side of a dinghy and, and, and collect your um, samples from the seawater or from the, the, the relative shallow sort of areas. So much of the commercial application has probably come from more easily accessible genetic resources. But at, at the moment, anybody who's got the money could send their small unmanned submarine device somewhere deep and go looking for things and just claim it. But the argument is, in fact, this belongs to all mankind, and so they should share it with everybody. So UNCLOS recognises that mineral resources are the common heritage of mankind. Uh, Developing countries have made the case that the same should apply for genetic resources. Uh, Developed countries would argue that this principle applies only to mineral genetic resources. How can they possibly make that argument, though, and sort of stand and look themselves in the mirror? You know, they just use the image of like a a crab walking on the seafloor and they consider the seafloor to be the common heritage of humankind. If you imagine this, how can the floor itself and the resource become an heritage of humankind and then a little crab walking on it not be it? Yeah. Well, it seems to me that it should belong to everybody and should be shared out, doesn't it? I mean, I suppose my, I mean, I don't know, but I'm, maybe I'm coming at this with a little bit of playground logic that everything should be shared out amongst the, amongst the population. And I think this, the starting point is uh, is the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. So that quite clearly states that mineral resources are the common heritage of mankind. It doesn't uh, clearly state that it's the same for uh, genetic resources. So that's where this sort of differing interpretation comes in. To be fair, um, I think we've seen at the last round of negotiations, uh, developed countries make some acknowledgements uh, in that area. So we've seen or we've heard of offers uh, that does start to meet principle that actually some form of monetary benefit sharing uh, will be shared. And I think that was where we kind of saw significant progress. But, but Alice, Alice, what would a system to fairly share this actually look like? There is one idea that was traveling around, I think, during the last negotiation round, and that's to have, I think, some kind of a flat rate approach. So every state that wants to do research has to pay a kind of fee regardless of what they collect or what gets published or commodified, and to put this into a fund. And this fund would redistribute it to those that don't have the capacities and especially also be something that is used for the development of marine technology and capacity. So I think when we look at the treaty, the different parts are connected. But then if you strike lucky and manage to find some genetic resources that are particularly useful for a particular reason, then it, it's up to you then to exploit it and to commercialize it and you can make the benefit from it, is make the profit from it. Is that right? Yes, but I think that the process, it takes so much time and that's what we often hear from the experts, that it's almost impossible to trace. Is there something that in the back room, or in the coffee area, that countries or groups of countries or areas of the world is there an, is there a part of the high seas that they've secretly got their eye on that they're negotiating they're trying to show goodwill but actually what they're really hoping to do is get the deal done and then go and try and explore x spot because they'd love to go and have have a look there to see because they think there's something interesting there i think everybody's concerned about their backyard and different parts of different uh, governments will have particular economic interests where they're defensive of, and then you've got geopolitics on top of that as well. So uh, certain countries with, um, and there are probably 10 or so big high seas fishing nations, and where they fish, they obviously have interest in in protecting their interests there. Uh, The deep seabed mining uh, interests obviously have uh, those countries who are sponsoring claims or have, have made claims or have an interest in those parts of the ocean where uh, polymetallic nodules are potentially being exploited. Um, And then you've got the the geopolitical hotspots where you've got overseas territories, where you've got disputed claims, or you've got uh, unresolved uh, territorial sea 
issues. Did you know that another major agreement to protect nature is on the table at the moment? Talks will take place in December in Montreal, Canada, to agree on the new Convention on Biological Diversity. There's a real need for a deal, as the latest report from WWF shows that global wildlife populations have plummeted in the last 50 years. One of the big questions is whether delegates in Montreal will agree to eliminate subsidies that are harmful to biodiversity. Alice, you've been there at these events. What's the atmosphere like, and Gillian too, what's the atmosphere like amongst people uh, at the discussions? Are there a lot of little negotiations behind closed doors? Because it's really hard for us as journalists from a distance to understand what's going on. And when I read some of the coverage that I see on official organs, I can't really understand what they're talking about either. What's kind of going on in terms of the conversations between people? Well, I would say as a political scientist, it takes a lot of time to understand what is going on because things are so complex. The diplomatic language, the diplomatic habitus is so difficult to unpack. It's very complicated to actually see the political, to see the conflicts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's worth bearing in mind these these conversations take place in the context of the United Nations headquarters in New York. And this is the kind of pinnacle of diplomacy. So the modus operandi is to be diplomatic. So it feels very nice and very rarely do things bubble over into sort of uh, outright conflict and uh, naming uh, states and so on. But there's also these concentric rings of opaqueness. So what you guys can see uh, if you're following on the uh, recorded TV, the UN TV, is only the plenary sessions. Uh, Then uh, if you're actually in New York, you can attend as an observer the uh, informal working groups. And and that's what I can attend and see. Uh, And a lot of work got done there so we could actually understand the substance. And then what's happened of late, uh, necessarily, that countries go into smaller working groups behind closed doors and the documents that's been discussed uh, will, some of that will be reported back to the working groups and that gets reported back to the plenary. Uh, But at the moment, because that work isn't complete, we don't know where it's landing. There is really a divide between those that have the capacities to do ocean science at than those that do not have the capacities. What you see, for instance, is that um, the US, European Union, Australia, but also Japan, for instance, and sometimes also China, because they are investing a lot in ocean science and in the technologies to be able to do it, they tend to align, although they wouldn't necessarily, you know, act as a block, but they have the same kind of interest to avoid new regulations on marine scientific research. One scientist told me that she thinks that there are actually 50 vessels that have the capacities to do research on the high seas, so it's a very limited number. One of the big targets is to establish huge marine protected areas as well. How are we progressing with that in terms of this idea of conservation and protection? I think that's uh, one of the more positive uh, developments in the recent round of negotiations. I think with the text that's on the table, we can see a mechanism for creating uh, marine protected areas on the high seas that aren't just paper parks. Uh, And this is the key bit. Uh, We need to actually include management measures that COP can agree. What's being discussed in terms of the ways of actually enforcing these marine protected areas and kind of policing them and making sure that they're respected? I mean, this is a crucial issue. If you can't enforce it, it's a bit meaningless. So in some ways, we rely on the existing organisations to do it. In other ways, we'll be looking at flag state sort of measures to try and make sure that uh, actors uh, on the high seas are are responsible for doing it. There's no magic emerging technology that allows us to do it then. It's going to end up being a paper park, but it doesn't really mean anything. I would hope that that's not where we end up. So I think the technology is there to monitor vessels for sure. Um, and with increased satellite coverage, you can see those that turn off their transponders and so on. Uh, so we'll be able to see where the vessels are on the high seas. I don't want to say I'm skeptical, but I think that marine protected areas, they have to be flexible. They have to be movable because many of these areas were described 10 years ago uh, and scientific data has moved on, uh, suggesting we might need other borders. So I think that's one of the issues that I see as, as problematic. The worry there is that uh, protected areas take a long time before they start delivering benefits. So uh, the question, as they're negotiating this treaty, 
or the concern is that a review might mean that you uh, that you give up on it before it started delivering its benefits. Alice, what would you consider to be a really good outcome for the oceans, but also a really good outcome for people as well? What does a really good outcome look like? To agree on international processes where experts are involved, scientists are involved that can measure progress, that can give advice, and that can make the instruments like marine protected areas and environmental impact assessment as really to matter in the practice of human activities on the ocean. Gillian, what do you think a really good outcome looks like? We need to fill the gaps in governance. Uh, so that means I, giving, giving teeth to the treaty uh, to, to make sure that, um, that countries can get together, agree to protected areas, but also agree to um, address the pressures on biodiversity. Uh, but working with the existing organisations where they have the ability, helping bring those organisations to the table and giving them capacity as well, acting as a broad church for all the different ocean actors to agree on the protections. Uh, it also needs to be future-proofed. So when we look at the environmental impact assessment provisions, uh, we need to be able to consider some sort of horizon scale technologies that might be operating and having impact on the high seas. And we don't want to be closing the door on potential mechanisms that this treaty, which could be a treaty for 50, 100 years to come, to not be hamstrung. Um, so that goes forward. And then I think it needs to address the inequalities of, uh, of access to the high seas. So everybody should have a way of feeding into uh, both the conservation as well as sustainable use of, uh, of its resources. Just to conclude, Julian, when do you think we'll have a deal done, ratified? So I'm really hopeful that, you know, we, we thought we would only need a week. If we can get two weeks and then include ministers come into the, to New York to sign off the deal, then I'm hopeful we can get something done in January. Ratification is a separate process. So once you've agreed the treaty, you then need countries to ratify it. Do you think we can get it done by 2030, Alice? Negotiating the treaty, yes. Ratifying, no. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, I don't know. Come on. I think we can get it done by 2030. You think so? Yeah. But not achieving the goals, I think. So it's difficult. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up there. It's fascinating talking to you both about this. And I do hope they manage to get the deal across the line and we can come back with another episode of Ocean Calls and talk about this. So thank you to Julian Jackson from the Pew Charitable Trusts and Alice Verdero from the University of Vienna for joining us on Ocean Calls. Thank you. Now to Ocean Favourites, the part of the podcast when a well-known person tells us all about their favourite ocean animal. Today's guest is a footballer who was given a BBC Green Sports Award for his efforts to promote environmental issues through the beautiful game. He created the We Play Green Foundation, a non-profit organisation that aims to encourage everyone on planet football to care more for planet Earth. Morten Thorsby plays in midfield for Bundesliga side Union Berlin and is part of the Norwegian national squad. Here, Morten tells us all about his ocean favourite. My name is uh, Morten Thorsby. I'm a professional football player at uh, Union Berlin in Germany, in the Bundesliga and uh, the Norwegian national team. My favorite marine animal is the seal. I'm born in Oslo and uh, two hours south of Oslo, we have a small island uh, where we have two small houses and where we, I grew up fishing and playing around in the water. And we have a quite a nice population of seals uh, around us uh, in this area where they normally show up in the surface of the water uh, to breed and to look around. And suddenly when you start to come closer, they always uh, snap under the water and they go away and they're gone. So I never actually managed to get closer than maybe 20 to 30 meters from the seals. I thought they were really nice animals. They had some kind of an awareness, something that you could relate to. I grew up having a golden retriever and I just think that their faces is so much uh, the like of a golden retriever. This is just a golden retriever without hair. This summer, I was actually um, going to um, do some free diving 
In Norway, we have an intruding species, actually the oyster from the Pacific. So I was actually going out free diving to, to get some, uh, some oysters. I brought my wetsuit uh, and my, my, my swimming brasses, my, uh, a knife, and I was going to hunt. This part of Norway is basically a lot of small islands and you can swim and you're, you can go between them. And then suddenly there was a seal on one of these islands and I was diving, I was in the water. So I started to get closer. And uh, the seal didn't move. I saw it looked up and it looked at me. And he was kind of just looking, what, what is this strange kind of this strange animal coming in a wetsuit and, <laughs> and glasses? It was like a dog. I got this complete same sensation as my, as my golden retriever. Just the same friendly look. And you know, the, the eyes are so incredibly cute and like deep. So I just got closer and closer, and in the end, I was I could touch it, but I was like, "Hey, this is strange because maybe you know maybe the seal is hurt because I think this is I've never actually gotten closer than t ten meters from 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 a seal uh, ever." I took it, I touched it, and I tried to pull the small swimming, uh, you know, the, their hands, which is like you know with the, with all the feathers between, so they can swim to look if, if, if he had some injuries or if it looked like something was wrong. But nothing seemed to be wrong. So the smell was very intense, like real ocean smell. And the skin was, you felt all that was incredible to watch their hands, all the small details, how it's layered to, to keep warm. And also the face, you know, with all the whiskers coming out of the nose, just like dogs. So I just had a very deep moment <laughs> just being close to it. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. So I just uh, rubbed the stomach like I do with my girl retriever a bit. And it seemed like it liked it. I actually pulled hair a little bit on the neck and it was like, like it was itching a little bit. And then I thought, okay, let's, this is too, too good to be true. I went back for free diving for, uh, for 10, 15 minutes and I came back and it was gone. So it swam away. No, it was incredible, and uh, I, I just got a confirmation on my on my theory that these are just uh, the dogs of the ocean. My thanks to Morton Thorsby for that brilliant story. The Ocean Calls podcast is created by ocean lovers here at Euronews for ocean fans around the world. And I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. And this series is produced by my colleagues, Naira Davlashian and Natalia Olsner. Editing is by Laurie Martinez, Chiara Santella and Luis Lopez from Studio Ochenta. The theme music is by Gabriel Dalmasso. And our editor-in-chief is Sophie Claude. If you want to find out more about Alice Vadro's work, go to her Twitter account, at Alice Vadro. For more on Julian Jackson, it's at all at C4. You can also check out the Pew Trusts account on at Pew Trusts. For more from Morton Thorsby, go to his Twitter account at Morton Thorsby. And please do check out his initiative, We Play Green. The podcast Ocean Calls is made possible by the European Commission's DG Mare. And you can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, CastBox or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. If you like the podcast, please give us a five-star rating, comment and tell your friends, because your help makes spreading the word about the ocean so much easier. If you want our team to read your comments on social media, use the hashtag Ocean Calls. If you're looking for something else to listen to, check out another Euronews podcast called Cry Like a Boy, exploring centuries-old gender stereotypes and how men in some African countries are helping to fight them. For more information on our podcast, go to our website, euronews.com, and a special mention to Ocean, a Euronews TV series created by our colleague and friend, Dennis Loctier. It is awesome. Have a look on euronews.com slash ocean. Follow world news from a European perspective on euronews.com.